Welcome to Morphology. Today we're going to start composition of words. And we're going to introduce a morpheme right off the bat. So what is a morpheme? A morpheme is the smallest unit of meaning in a language. So here's some examples in English. We have words like train and fat. We know what these words mean. And they don't have any augments to them. So when you think of train, you think of one object. And when you think of fat, you think of, well, you think of one specific property. Now there's other types of morphemes here, like ER, which is a comparative morpheme. So if we say fatter, if you say fatter and combine the two, so if you take these two together, it makes the word fatter. There's sometimes some other letter changes in there, but this is just the underlying morpheme, and it means that something is fatter than the other. It is more fat than something else you're comparing it to. And there's also the S morpheme, which is the plural morpheme. So you can combine train with the plural morpheme, and you can make trains. So these have the smallest unit of meaning. We may never see some of these morphemes on their own, like you would never just see ER in a sentence all by itself. You have to attach it to a word, but it still has a unit of meaning attached to it. So, here's a question. How many morphemes are in each of these words? Okay, well, you can do this along with me. If you want to pause the video and do it real quick, go right ahead. Uh, tempting. Okay. Well, tempting. Hmm. Well, is something tempting? Is is there a word tempt? Oh, is he tempted by it? Hmm. Yeah, you can say tempted. So, that means that there must be a root of tempts. And then there's this suffix, ing. So we have two morphemes here. We have tempt as a word, and ing as a progressive meaning. So it's progressive. The action of tempt is ongoing. Okay, what about dog? Okay, well this is fairly straightforward. It's a word, has no suffixes or anything, so dog is just a morpheme on its own. Cats. Well, you have the idea of a cat, and then you have the plural morpheme. So that's two. Judgers. Okay, this one, a little bit trickier. So we know this S here means there's more than one. Okay, and we know judge is a word. So we have judge, and then we have this er. Okay, so we have three morphemes here. Judge, er, and S. So judge is our verb here or it might even be a noun, we don't quite know which one it is, it doesn't necessarily matter. So we have this judge, and then we have this ER that makes it a judger, so that's a person, and then judgers is a multiple people, or is multiple people, not is a multiple people. So this word judgers is composed of three different units of meaning that we aren't even aware is happening when we do it. So how do we do this? Well, first we need to distinguish types of morphemes. So there's free morphemes and there's bound morphemes. So free morphemes, three free morphemes are standalone, which means they're words. We can use them in a sentence on their own. While bound morphemes, we can't. So jump, you can say jump on its own. So jump is free, but this ER is bound because we can't just say, yeah, that er over there is doing something. No, it, this bound morpheme modifies the word jump. What about implied? Well, implied is made up of the word imply and the past tense suffix. So this ed is going to be bound to the word imply. And of course, all words are free so imply is a free morpheme. What about faithful? Well, 
faith is a word. So it's free on its own. And full is a suffix that attaches to faith. So it's going to be bound. So normally when we write free and bound morphemes, if it's free, it's just going to be a word. We'll call it X, Y, Z. And if it's bound, then it's going to look like one of these three forms. It's going to have a dash with an XY or whatever letters to symbolize it being a suffix. You might have XY on the front, and these can be any letters with a dash on the right to be a prefix, or an infix might look something like that. Of course, those are just variables. So we have ED takes this form right here. Okay, so that's the difference between free and bound morphemes. So, affixes. Affixes are prefixes, suffixes, infixes. So, these don't have lexical categories. So, they're not nouns, they're not verbs, they're not adjectives. They're just morphemes, they're just bound morphemes. And they attach to words to either change or to keep the lexical category is the same. So I'll show you that in a second. So let's classify affixes and draw some trees. Okay, well we have prefixes. Now prefixes attach to the beginning of words here. So we have unkind and deactivate. So what we do when we draw trees is we just put the prefix out front and we separate it from the morpheme. So we just separate all of our morphemes here. So again, un and kind are two different morphemes. Un is an affix, so we write af. Kind is an adjective, and we link them up. So un and kind makes unkind, and that is also an adjective. Okay, what about deactivate? Well, we have d, and we have activate. D is an affix, activate is a verb, and deactivate together is also a verb. So we take our prefix, combine it with our free morpheme, and it becomes a new word. All right, suffixes. Suffixes come on the end of words. And we do this the same way. We have vividly and clue less. So vivid is a, hmm, it is an adjective. You can describe something as being vivid. ly is just an affix. And we can combine them to make vividly. Now, of course, what type of word is vividly? He vividly described the outcome. So this is actually an adverb. So we can see here that this affix actually changed the word type of vivid. It changed its category. That's kind of interesting. Okay, what about clueless? Well, clue is a noun, and less is just an affix. When we combine it together, we get clue clueless, which is an adjective. So again, this affix changed the lexical category of one of our free morphemes. It's kind of cool that this can happen. So those are prefixes and suffixes. There's one more that we don't have in English, but we do have in Tagalog. So this is a Tagalog example. So we have Billy to buy. Of course, my vowels might be off. I didn't have a phonetic chart for this. But we can get Billy, which is by. So we have Billy right here. And then we have Benilli to mean bought. So what happens here is we take B and we just add in this morpheme in the center. And what's the difference between by and bought? Well, this is present tense to buy, and this is past tense for bought. So this ni infix that goes in the middle of words is the past tense 
morpheme. Now, drawing a tree for this is not exactly possible. At least it's not possible to be nice and neat looking. So we're not going to draw trees for infixes. But these are another type of affix that occurs in other languages. So infixes are cool. Let's do some practice here. Draw them yourself and I will do them in just a moment here. Okay, well hopefully you tried this out. We're going to start off with books because books is pretty straightforward. We have the word book and we have the plural s. So book is a noun, the plural s is just an affix, and we can combine them together to make a new noun, books. Okay, not that bad. Let's try blackened. So black is a word. Blacken, yeah, you can blacken something. So we have this suffix en, and we also have this suffix ed. So we kind of have this multi-layered tree. So black, uh, we'll call this an adjective. And then we have two affixes here. Now how do we combine affixes? Well, bound morphemes have to be attached to free morphemes or to other bound morphemes. So what we'll do is we will attach the morpheme, black, the free morpheme, to the closest bound morpheme first. So we have blacken. Now blacken, what is blacken? That is a verb. Okay. You can blacken something. Okay, what about blackened? It was blackened. So this is also a verb. Okay, so there are two trees for some words. Now you notice here that this suffix s did not change the lexical category, but this suffix en changed the category here. And this ed category, or this ed morpheme, didn't change the category. Okay, what's, what's up with this? Well, next time we're going to talk about the difference between those two, which is derivational versus inflectional morphemes. And then we're going to talk about how some morphemes work in other languages, and there are sometimes internal changes, sometimes this thing called suppletion happens, reduplication, and there's also stress differences when we speak words. So, next time we'll cover these. As always, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. And if you want to check out more videos, go to trevtutor.com. And there's more there. So, have a great day, and I'll see you guys, hopefully, next time.